Welcome to the stage of history retold. I played every Soul Calibur game, here's my thoughts. Before I get started, two things. First, I'm about to run a really unique Soul Calibur 6 tournament, and it's open to everyone. I'll explain it a bit more later, but there's limited slots available, so if you're interested, join the Discord for more information. Link in the description. Also, this video is sponsored by NordVPN, and I'll talk a bit more about them later, too. If you like this kind of content, or you like my videos, or you want to see more videos like this, please consider subscribing, and liking the video, and commenting, and sharing, and all that stuff. I know everyone says that, but it really, really does help. But enough of that. That. Let's get right into the games. Soul Edge was released in arcades in 1996. The Soul series has a few distinct elements that are present in each game, albeit sometimes with minor adjustments. But for almost every single game, these are the basics. Every character has their own weapon, style, and abilities, but the controls for each character are the same. You have a standard horizontal attack, a vertical attack, a kick, a guard, and you can combine these buttons to perform special moves and grabs. I know I'm describing basically all fighting games here, but bear with me. The Soul Calibur series in general has an eight-way run movement system where you can move toward and away from the opponent, but also in a circle around them. This movement is a bit more limited in Soul Edge and Soul Blade, with a lot more emphasis on jumping and dead-on combat, but it's still here to a smaller degree. Aside from the movement, the core gameplay in every Soul Calibur game is a basic moveset in horizontal, vertical, and kick attacks, along with grabs that change depending on the angle where you grab the opponent. Unlike other fighting games where you block by holding away from the opponent, you block in Soul Calibur by holding down a dedicated button. You have a parry type move called guard impacts that can interrupt opponents' attacks during your blocks too. Guard impacts have a bit more depth to them, especially in later games with counters and just impacts, but I'm probably not going to get too into those. In addition to these standard moves, every character has their own unique set of attacks using different combinations of buttons and inputs. You know, like most fighting games, but this game has a couple of extra attacks too, including the unblockable attacks and critical edges. The unblockable attacks are chargeable attacks with varying inputs depending on the character. These are flashy and powerful moves that can break an opponent's guard, but they're risky since they usually have a charge up time. I mentioned this earlier, but you also have a critical edge, which is a special move that has two parts. The initial attack, which has the same input for every character at the cost of a third of the weapon gauge, followed by an extended combo attack using unique inputs that vary by the character. These are incredibly powerful attacks, but also incredibly technical and risky if you're not watching your weapon gauge. Speaking of, a big element to the fights in Soul Edge is the weapon weapon gauge, visible under your HP bar. This gauge is literally your weapon's durability. If you guard attacks, this gauge goes down over time. If you perform a critical edge, you lose a whole third of the gauge regardless of whether or not it lands. If the gauge is completely emptied, you lose your weapon entirely and have to fight with your fists. A mechanic so unique that I'm actually kind of bummed that future games didn't include it. It seems like everyone has an identical moveset when they lose their weapon too, so you have to be super careful with how you use your specials if you don't want to be stuck, you know, weaponless. Again, this mechanic never returns outside of the console port of this game. If you and an enemy attack at the same time with a similar attack, there's a blade struggle mechanic where you cross blades and outside of the console port, I'm not sure that this ever returns either. Finally, an element that the Soul series has that a lot of fighting games don't is the presence of ring outs, which instantly end the round. While all stages have invisible barriers that stop you from just running off the side, you can knock an opponent off with a launch attack or sufficiently aggressive connecting attack into the edge of a stage. Of course, you can be knocked off of the stages and even accidentally jump off on your own with a misplaced special ability, but the ring-out system here is pretty unique, and I don't know if any other fighting games do it quite like the Soul series. As this is an arcade game, you select a character and play their arcade route until you either win and get their ending, or you get a game over and don't continue. Every character faces Cervantes as their final enemy, who then transforms into Soul Edge. After defeating Soul Edge, you get a unique ending with some nice artwork and a little story told through some text. Every character has a full backstory, and while you do get snippets of it from these endings, I'd be lying if I said I really learned anything significant from these. Of course, I do need to mention the roster just a little bit. The Soul series is a long-running series, and like other long-running fighting game series, the roster they established in the very first title is still there in the newest title, for the most part. I'd say the most notable characters in the first game are probably Siegfried, Mitsurugi, Voldo, Taki, and Cervantes. Not to detract from any of the other characters, of course, but these are the characters that you're gonna see in nearly every future title. Soul Edge is incredibly straightforward, and while it doesn't do anything ridiculously fancy, it's a solid start. Fortunately, it also got a home 
port in the form of Soul Blade on the PlayStation, and because they're so similar, let's take a look. Soul Blade was released on the PlayStation in 1996 in Japan and 1997 in the West. This game's cinematic intro is really cool. It has this super wacky 90s anime intro energy with the song choice. I don't want to risk playing it here and getting like a copyright strike, but this is almost like the kind of thing that you'd hear in like, I don't know, a four kids anime dub opening, but in a good way. I love it. As a home port, Soul Blade looks incredibly similar to Soul Edge to me in nearly every way. Obviously, there's tiny minute differences, but they did a pretty good job in translating the appearance of a full arcade game into a similar experience on a home console, which was no easy feat at the time. Gameplay-wise, it feels, to me, identical to Soul Edge, which again is pretty impressive for a home port. Of course, since this is a home port, there's now modes available. The modes are Arcade Mode, Versus Battle Mode, Team Battle Mode, Time Attack Mode, Survival Mode, Practice Mode, and Edge Master Mode. The Arcade Mode plays out identically to how we saw it in Soul Edge, but this time the character endings are fully in-engine 3D endings with voice acting to boot. These are really entertaining, and I definitely prefer this to the storybook text dump that we saw in Soul Edge. Some characters also have alternate endings from using certain button inputs at the right time. For example, in Siegfried's normal ending, he takes the Soul Edge in his hand only for it to take over his body and transform him into Nightmare. He then stands ominously over a cliffside above a city at night. In the alternate ending, Siegfried destroys the Soul Edge, but goes to the same cliffside in the daylight, sorrowfully asking his father for forgiveness. The fully rendered endings were already cool enough. The extra alternate ones are just the cherry on top. There's a few secret unlockable characters in this version of the game, including a sort of proto-nightmare called Siegfried with an exclamation mark, and also, you know, uh, fan service. Edge Master Mode is a linear mission-based mode where you select a character and fight a series of missions with different objectives or limitations. You're put on this big map screen where you can navigate from area to area. Once you reach an area, you're able to read the story involving your character and then challenge the mission's enemy or enemies. Some battles are just straightforward fights, but most of them have unique elements like multi-enemy battles, your HP draining over time, or even a battle where you're not able to win unless you defeat the opponent with a throw. There's all kinds of these missions, and every character has their own set of them. Along the way, you're also unlocking new weapons, each one with its own stats. I really like the Edge Master mode a lot, not only because I love the variety of missions, but also because it's the first opportunity that the series had to actually give some background lore on these characters. Of course, I do also like the variety. Sir Frederick met the lovely Margaret and spent the night in her arms. After nine months of battle, Frederick returned to find that Margaret had given him a son. What a way to say that they just banged. Edge Master mode is a really fun alternative to just doing the arcade mode. The different spins on battles with mission objectives keeps it feeling fresh versus just playing fight after fight in a normal arcade mode. I think the single player content is where this series really thrives the most. And it's obvious how much of a priority it was even this early on in the series. Once you've completed Edge Master with a character, you actually get their arcade ending from Soul Edge, which is pretty awesome and means that nothing is lost in the translation from the arcade version to the home port. During the credits, you also get a fun little slideshow of all the weapons that you unlocked. There's a few more modes here, including the team battle mode, where you and an AI opponent have a team of up to five characters and battle it out one character at a time. If you lose a character, you move on to the next character and vice versa with the opponent. The winning character regains only a little HP between matches too. The first person to lose all of their characters loses the match. Also new is the time attack mode. This mode seems to just be kind of a secondary arcade mode, but this one breaks down each match by the time it took you to complete it. This is the first game to include a survival mode, which is a mode where you fight a series of enemies with one character and one persistent health bar and only minor healing between rounds. The goal is to win as many fights as you can without getting knocked out. I think, if anything, I prefer the team battle mode to this, though it's kind of like a pseudo-survival mode and you actually get closure since it definitively ends, unlike this mode. I kind of said this earlier, but Soul Edge and Soul Blade are very strong starts to an incredibly good series, but they do kind of live in the shadow of Soul Calibur and its sequels. The gameplay style, while similar to the games that we're most familiar with, is just different enough that it might turn some people off to considering this a true mainline entry. I like it though, because it's a charming entry that doesn't do anything super crazy by modern standards, but does have a level of novelty given how closely it's tied to its successors. Soul Calibur was released in arcades in 1998 and for the Sega Dreamcast in 1999. The intro to Soul Calibur is a lot less campy, but more in line with the grand and epic scale and more serious tone that the series is known for. It features cinematic shots of the main cast, giving everyone a little bit of time in the spotlight. It's not my favorite opening in the series, but it's definitely solid. Due to social factors of the time, some versions of the arcade version of Soul Calibur replaced Mitsurugi entirely with a new character called Arthur. He played identically 
identically and looked very similar, but had a different appearance and backstory, complete with modified artwork in his arcade ending. While I did play the arcade version of Soul Calibur, this is one of the few instances of an early console version of a fighting game being the absolute best way to experience it. The Dreamcast port seems to have improved the game in nearly every way. The most prominent immediate improvements lying in the visuals and the addition of a bunch of content and modes. And for starters, I have to point out that Soul Calibur is the first game in the series to make the enemy repeat their knockout cry if you keep hitting them after winning a round. <laughs> For some reason, this has always been so iconic to me, and it was present in every game until I believe Soul Calibur 5. As for gameplay, Soul Calibur is the start of what I'd consider to be the modern Soul Calibur experience. The movement mechanics are adjusted and improved from the ones that we saw in Soul Edge and Soul Blade, the characters feel a lot more responsive and smooth in their abilities, and the overall game feel is just nailed. I don't know how to explain it, but if you've only ever played the newest Soul Calibur game and then went back to play this one, I think you would barely have to adjust just your playstyle for the most part. Yeah, the newer games introduce unique mechanics, but for the basic core gameplay, it's all here. Anyways, on to actual modes. As you play the game and clear certain conditions in different modes, you unlock stages and characters. You unlock characters and stages in the arcade mode, followed by more stages and museum editions in the mission battle mode. Getting right into the arcade mode, arcade endings are back to 2D artwork with some text. And speaking of character endings, the character roster here is expanded quite a bit to introduce even more or long-running series staples like Nightmare, Ivy, Killick, and Yoshimitsu, who is technically borrowed from the Tekken series, I think? I don't actually know how that works. I just know that he's been in the Soul Calibur series almost as long as he's been in Tekken at this point. In the mission mode, you complete a series of missions that can be chosen from a big map. There's a little bit of story here, and these missions can be tackled by any character you have unlocked. It's actually super similar to the Edge Master mode from Soul Blade. You earn money from every mission, which can be used to buy artwork in the art gallery, and some artwork unlocks more mission mode stages and missions. Sometimes you even unlock full stages for use outside of the mode too. My issue with this unlock strategy though is that you end up having to grind missions over and over to earn money to unlock this artwork. And while I love gallery modes in games, I don't know how I feel about tying the gallery to progression, especially since you never know which unlock will actually let you proceed in the mode or if you're just going to be unlocking some eye candy. You can kind of sort of guess by focusing on the more expensive ones, but still. Survival mode returns, but there's also an additional extra survival mode that works the same way, but this time it's sudden death. Whoever hits first wins. It's a pretty fun mode to play around with one time, but it's more of a novelty that I don't think I'd touch too many times unless someone came in and challenged my high score or something. Museum mode includes the art gallery, battle theater, exhibition theater, opening direction, and character profiles. Battle theater is a CPU versus CPU spectator mode with the option to make the camera a free controllable camera. Exhibition theater is a mode where you can see pre-made demonstrations of each character. Opening direction is the opening cutscene for the game. Character profile is a full-on deep dive for each character where you can look at a bio, the character stage, a biography of their weapon, voice lines, and their ending scene. It's pretty cool and we actually see this profile mode come back in some form in most of the future games. I said this earlier, but Soul Calibur really does feel like the quote-unquote first real Soul series game. Not to detract from Soul Edge and Soul Blade, it's just that the game feel that Soul Calibur establishes is almost perfection, to the point that outside of straight-up additions to existing mechanics, the foundation of the game seems entirely unchanged over 20 years later. As someone who enjoys fighting games for the casual aspects, I know that my opinion on technical things in these games isn't as informed, but I can say that Soul Calibur feels amazing to play. In fact, every numbered Soul Calibur game from here on out feels amazing in the same way, which only further speaks to this game's quality. Soul Calibur 2 was released in arcades in 2002, followed by a home console release in 2003. In 2013, the game would receive an online-capable HD remaster. Soul Calibur 2 has one of my favorite intros in the entire series because it goes 0 to 100 really fast. There's tons of action, multiple character introductions, and even custom segments for each guest character depending on which platform you're playing the game on. Overall, this is probably my favorite intro in the series. A lot of Soul Calibur games do that thing where a character says the name name of the game on the title screen, but one of my favorite things about 2 is that they also get Link to do it in the GameCube version, but instead of saying the name, he just starts screaming. Soul Calibur 2. 
Of course, Soul Calibur 2 was the beginning of the guest character trend in this series, with each home version of the game featuring a different character. The PS2 version got Heihachi from the Tekken series, the Xbox version got Spawn, a comic book character, and the GameCube version got Link from the Legend of Zelda series, complete with Nobuyuki Hiyama reprising the role from Ocarina of Time. Each guest character has their own complete set of gallery entries, unique weapons, and story segments in the arcade mode. Gameplay-wise, this game plays nearly identically to Soul Calibur 1 to me. The modes in Soul Calibur 2 are original original, extra, weapon master, and museum, but each of these modes has a bunch of different modes buried into it. In original mode, we have arcade mode, versus battle, time attack, survival, team battle, versus team battle, and practice. The extra modes are the same as the original modes, but with the ability to equip characters with different weapons that have modified stats. Arcade mode works similarly to how we saw in previous games with a series of battles along with a rival battle. Exclusive to the HD version are additional online multiplayer modes, but otherwise the game is identical and features as far as I can tell. There were apparently some kind of balance changes under the hood, but I'm not familiar enough with the balance of each individual character to be able to tell the difference. They did fix some of the characters' names though, which were spelled differently in the original versions of the game. Oh, and of course, the HD version includes all guest characters except for Link. Weapon Master Mode is the primary single-player mode. It's a linear story told through a branching path of selectable missions. The map has a branching path with tons of missions and it's broken up into story chapters. As you take on missions with any character, character, you earn gold, which can be used to buy weapons with different stats, along with extra unlockable items in the mode's shop, like other modes and costumes. Speaking of weapon stats, each weapon has different stats with bonuses and drawbacks, like reach and defense. In addition to the normal missions on the overworld map, there's also dungeons with branching paths and tons of enemies with various mission conditions to battle. Some dungeon battles can be booby-trapped too, which gives the battle an unknown modifier like increased damage on knockdowns or even invisible enemies. The dungeons can be of varying lengths, but the goal is to get to the dungeon boss and leave victorious. Completing the dungeon counts as completing a single mission in the overworld map, but given that you get bonuses in the form of money, longer missions like these dungeons can be very rewarding. And I almost forgot to mention, a lot of the missions in this mode have special modifiers like quicksand or heavy wind that make a lot of the fights more challenging and not super straightforward. I really enjoy these fun little modifiers and I think they're something that should be in the modern games but aren't. The story in this mode is told almost entirely through text and it's interesting enough, but I just never found myself getting too invested into it. Fortunately, the mode itself is a ton of fun with a ridiculous amount of replay value and tons of mission variety. Plus, you can switch characters between missions anytime you want and equip them with any weapons anytime you want, and some characters are better suited for certain missions too. This is starting to be kind of a running trend, but Weapon Master mode is very similar to previous Edge Master or Mission modes, but Weapon Master also feels a lot meatier in general and I think I prefer it to any of the previous modes. I remember as a kid I'd grind out some of the money-making battles over and over so I could buy out the shop's weapons, especially since collecting the weapons had an added element of fun with extra weapons for the guest characters included. This game begins the fun tradition of unlocking joke weapons like Nightmare's Giant Squid or even Link's Bug Catching Net, so Soul Calibur 2 feels like it took the bones of Soul Calibur 1 and just expanded it, which is actually a really excellent move since this game feels just as fantastic as the last one, just with higher production values. In fact, Soul Calibur 2 is the only game in the series I can think of where a ton of the character designs didn't even really change that much from the last game. Overall, I think Soul Calibur 2 is one of the best entries in the series, and we're not even halfway through yet. Soul Calibur 3 was released for the PlayStation 2 in 2005 and in arcades in 2006. Soul Calibur 3's intro is seemingly a lot more story focused than the previous ones we've seen, but still super action packed. It starts out a little bit slow, but we quickly get into the nice explosive character showcase that we've come to expect. I like it a lot just because of how unique it is, plus there's no way to see Nightmare peering at you and not feel just a little bit threatened. If you sit on the title screen for long enough, you get a cool demonstration sequence. There's two possible options, either a short showcase of a single character or a battle between two AI in real time. It's basically an AI versus AI fight, but with a dynamic camera. I love this though, and it's almost like an evolved arcade attract screen. So as far as gameplay changes go in Soul Calibur 3, I honestly can't think of anything super significant. There's no big gimmick that I can think of, and most of the gameplay elements from previous games come here unchanged. I could be completely wrong, or maybe I'm completely forgetting something, but Soul Calibur 3 
3 feels like it just kind of expanded what we saw in 2. And by expanded, I mean added a ton more modes. The single player modes in this game are the Tales of Souls mode, Chronicles of the Sword, World Competition, Soul Arena, Practice, Museum, and Character Creation. This game also has a very hefty roster size even before you unlock the extra unlockable characters. Plus, even then, it seems smaller than it actually is, as some of the characters are inside their own menu. Though, to be fair, these bonus characters are mostly based on existing characters. First and foremost, let me go over the shop mode. Shop mode includes a weapons shop, armor shop, and items shop. Here, you can buy items using gold that you earn in most other modes. The weapons and armor can be equipped to the base character and custom characters, and the item shop includes stuff like artwork for the museum. Each shop has its own NPC with a distinct personality, and while you can access the shop from other modes, it also has its own place nestled on the main menu for some reason. Tales of Souls is a brand new single player story mode for each individual character. When you select a character in Tales of Souls, you're also prompted to select from that character's unlocked weapons, which, like the last game, all have different stats. From there, you get a nice introduction in the form of scrolling text, which gives you a bunch of information about that character's backstory. Before each battle, you get a text lore segment similar to what we saw in the mission modes from previous games, but this time you also get opportunities to select story choices to progress. When you select these choices, it can completely alter the story path and lead you to different story opportunities and different fights too. There are special fights sometimes, like the doppelganger fights, where before the fight, you'll get a cutscene with a QTE. If you fail the QTE, you begin the fight with reduced HP. The final boss in this mode is usually Abyss, an enemy that's basically a demonic form of Zasalamel, but by getting to the end without using any continues and taking a specific route with dialogue choices, you can also end up against a final boss called Night Terror, which is a super buffed up version of Nightmare. If you go this route, you're put up against this game's Edge Master in the form of Olkadan, and this fight is wildly tough, like unbelievably tough, and I'm gonna be honest, I only did the Night Terror route once because of the Olkadan fight. It definitely reminded me of the insane Akuma fight in the Street Fighter movie game, which I actually covered in this video right here. Also, I realized that I've never mentioned the Edge Master. In almost every Soul Calibur game, there's at least one Edge Master character. Edge Master is a character who has his own unique design, but can use any character's weapons and fighting style. Anyways, the ending in this mode can have a QTE, and winning or failing that QTE completely changes the ending. Every character basically has a good or bad ending, or at least a good or better ending. After Tales of Souls, which is already a pretty chunky mode, we have an equally chunky mode in Chronicles of the Sword. This mode is a full single player campaign where you take a custom character into a massive war. This mode also has a fully narrated FMV intro, so you know it's about to get real. The general gameplay loop here is that you take your custom character, along with any characters that you've picked up along the story, into these missions called Chronicles. The goal in these Chronicles is to take over the enemy's main stronghold while protecting your main stronghold. This is accomplished through what is almost a real-time strategy-like interface, where you move individual units along a predefined branching route. On these routes, there are allied and enemy strongholds. These small strongholds can be reinforced for gold currency to increase their defenses against unit attacks. If a unit, friendly or enemy, destroys a stronghold, it will fall and control of that stronghold will be taken by that unit's faction. Well, unless there are units in the stronghold, in which case a battle will commence and the winning faction takes control of the stronghold, or the attackers are defeated and the stronghold recovers itself automatically over time. Units can also encounter other units on the field, and you can let them fight it out on the field, or you can interrupt the fight and go into a normal battle with the remaining HP of each unit. If you lose a unit in a chronicle, they respawn after a predetermined amount of time, but if you lose all of your units at once, that's a game over. After each battle, your unit gains experience and can level up, which increases their overall stats. While you can overcome a sheer level gap with careful gameplay, enemies with high stats can be incredibly hard-hitting, making challenging them sometimes risky. Before starting any chronicle, you have to choose which units will be on the battlefield and where they'll start. You can also outfit them with different weapons and even access the shop mode from here. On top of the units that you've unlocked in the mode, you can bolster your forces with custom characters that you've made, too. Chronicles of the Sword is almost a straight-up strategy RPG built right into Soul Calibur 3, which is really cool and not something I would normally expect from a fighting game. Not only that, but it's super story-heavy, too, with a ton of text exposition, field dialogue, and even voiced in-battle cutscenes. I'm gonna be honest, I couldn't completely finish this mode in time for this video's release, but I did notice that as I progressed further in, the difficulty started to climb pretty rapidly. You gain EXP even when you lose a battle, which makes losing over and over a slow but, I guess, valid way of eventually overcoming a loss, but slow means that I have to eventually move on so I can make the rest of the video. Overall, Chronicles of the Sword is an excellent mode, and in my first 
first Soul Calibur video, I got a lot of flack for just kind of glazing over it. This one's to you, Soul Calibur 3 fans. I was wrong about this mode. The next single player mode is World Competition. There are two options, Tournament or League, but they're both just different formats of the same thing, which is a tournament where you have to win 12 consecutive matches on a ladder. The final standard single player mode is Soul Arena, which actually has two modes in it. The first is Quick Play, which is essentially just this game's arcade mode where you fight a series of fights. You know, how it works normally. After that, there's a Mission Mode, which is a series of challenges very reminiscent of the Edge Master and similar mission modes from previous games, and each mission, available in three difficulties, has special requirements to clear it. Some of the requirements from Soul Calibur 2 even make a return. There's even a mission where you get to fight the shopkeepers. Character creation makes its debut in Soul Calibur 3 and is surprisingly in-depth for a first attempt. You can create a custom character with their own unique movesets that are separate from the rest of the main cast, even with their own unique set of weapons. There's a few classes including ninjas, pirates, and even a dancer who fights with tambourines. There's quite a lot of customization options too, all the way down to the socks. Depending on what you've equipped, you have an alignment bar that goes up or down and affects your character's personality. I'm not exactly sure how it works, but this is something I actually never even noticed growing up playing this game. Then again, I spent most of my time trying to recreate Final Fantasy characters growing up, so I guess I can't really blame myself there. You can also customize the base roster, but only changing their colors. Still, it is cool that this is even an option. Also, one last tidbit about the character creation. While this game doesn't have a formal guest character on the character select, this game does include full customization options for creating Cosmos from the Xenosaga games. I like the creative inclusion, but as someone who played the Xenosaga games as a kid, seeing a fully fleshed Cosmos character with a unique moveset would have been a lot cooler. So as far as the sheer volume of the content is concerned, Soul Calibur 3 is dense. There's a lot here, and I'll be honest, that's something that I failed to fully appreciate in my first Soul Calibur video. The amount of time it would take to naturally experience all of this content would be a lot more than you could say even for modern fighting games, let alone some of the barebone fighting games from the era. Now, I personally don't necessarily think that more modes equals more quality, but I definitely can understand why this is considered by many to be one of the best games, if not the best game in the series, at least judging from the comments on my last video. It's not my personal favorite entry, but I can appreciate the love and detail that clearly went into this. Soul Calibur Legends was released initially for the Nintendo Wii in 2007. Legends is a story-heavy role-playing hack-and-slash spin-off featuring Siegfried as the primary protagonist. There are two main modes in this game, Quest Mode and Party Mode. Quest Mode is the story mode. Throughout the mode, there are a variety of cutscenes with different styles. The first kind is what I'll call event scenes. These are fully voiced scenes with dynamic and sometimes animated artwork to accompany it. I really like these scenes, and I think they're one of the best things to come out of this game. In fact, the game's art style is excellent through and through, and I have nothing bad to say about it. I do wonder what it would have looked like if not limited to the Wii's specs, though. The next kind of cutscenes are the 3D in-engine scenes. These are also fully voiced and pretty self-explanatory. These tend to show up the least, but I actually weirdly wish that these were just in the style of the event scenes. Finally, the cutscene style that you see most are the dialogue scenes that happen in between quest missions. These have 2D character artwork and text boxes, but no voice acting. They're not wildly good or bad or anything, but they get the job done and have a nice variety of characters. You probably noticed that I haven't talked about the gameplay yet, and that's because the gameplay here is just waggle city. This is one of those Wii games where every single attack and special movement is done with a swing or a flick of the Wii remote, or the nunchuck, or a combination of the two. I'd go into more detail, but I don't even think I really have to. Outside of basic movement and the soul charge ability, everything your character does is activated through flailing your arms, pretty much. Vertical swings are vertical attacks, horizontal swings are horizontal attacks, inward swings or jabs and flicking the nunchuck activates a directional dodge that can be comboed into a quick attack. There's a fillable soul gauge under your character's HP bar and this gauge can be used to activate a soul charge which increases the strength of your attacks and gives you access to special combos. Each mission takes place in a different zone with a pretty wide variety of locales. The goal of the missions are really just to crawl the dungeons and make it to the end of the quest, defeating any enemies and bosses along the way. I will say there are some pretty cool boss fights in this game but you have to kind of survive through the mm, boring mission first. As you progress through the story, you encounter more classic Soul Calibur characters and unlock them for use in any missions that you want. Before each mission, you choose the characters that you want to bring into battle and you can swap between them at any time. Each character also has their own health and soul gauges, meaning that you can tactically swap them out depending on the situation. Each playable character has their own special moves and abilities, but the core controls are the same. Well, the core arm swings, but you know what I mean. The guest character in this game is Lloyd from Tales of Symphonia, which, when you think about it, is a pretty neat choice since he's a super RPG character 
character and this is an RPG. On top of that, he's actually involved in the story, which is a really neat touch and makes him feel like more than just an afterthought. I really can't say that I'm the biggest fan of this game's gameplay in general though. After a few missions, you start to realize that there's just not a lot going on. I kind of hinted at this earlier, but the missions are bare bones with enemy after enemy and flail session after flail session, but then just dull running around looking for the next event to trigger and even the new events just felt like repetitive retreads of things I've already done a thousand times. The only real payoffs were the boss fights. Also, every time I interacted with this game, I spent the entire time just wishing I was playing it on a standard controller. I think this game would have appealed to a lot more people if it was released on other platforms with more traditional controls, and honestly, you wouldn't even really have to change that much to make the traditional controls work. The waggling and flailing truly does feel like a gimmick in this game, and I think it limits the game's potential significantly. There is a multiplayer party mode that allows for a second player to join you with a handful of co-op, competitive, and versus missions. Unfortunately, I didn't have a second player to try this with, and even if I did, I turned my place upside down looking for my second Wii Remote to no avail. At the end of the day, though, I really wish this was released on something other than the Wii, or at the very least, that the Wii version had an option for standard controls with the classic controller or something. Then again, not having to flail your arms might make it more apparent just how repetitive and boring this game can feel at times. I kind of wish we saw Lloyd in a standard Soul Calibur game as a guest character, but I'll take what I can get. It is still really neat to see how he's actually involved in the story to some degree though, and that, along with the excellent art style, is one of the few things that makes this game at least worth checking out if you're a Soul Calibur fan. If not, I don't really think I could recommend this. Maybe watch a playthrough online. Soul Calibur 4 was released for the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 in 2008. The intro in this one is kind of a downgrade from previous games. It focuses a lot on the new big baddie Algol, with not much else going on for the first almost minute, it feels like. It does eventually get into the good stuff with character showcases, but even that is short-lived and feels more like it was meant to showcase the guest characters only. This is probably one of the weaker intros in the series. Soul Calibur 4's gameplay is probably the most changed in the series from a previous major entry. First off, there's a brand new character switching mechanic where you can swap in different characters from your team in the middle of matches. Character switching has a gauge associated with it, and when you use charges in the gauge, you can refill them by connecting attacks on opponents. This switching mechanic isn't really a huge deal in the grand scheme of things, which is weird to me since there are entire games and other fighting game series that are built around this one mechanic, but I don't think any future Soul Calibur games ever use this again. Anyways, the biggest feature that I think Soul Calibur 4 brings to the table is its critical finish system. The Soul Gauge is back in the form of a circular gauge next to each character's HP, and its color changes from green to red as the character blocks attacks. The gauge can be recovered by landing attacks, but if the gauge goes critical and breaks, the opponent has a tiny window to activate a critical finish. These are incredibly powerful moves with dedicated cutscenes that end the round instantly, regardless of the victim's remaining HP. This mechanic seems like it was introduced to reduce the viability of spamming block. I honestly don't really have much of an opinion on this system, though. I think the critical finish scenes are really cool, but outside of that, you don't ever really see critical finishes happen all that much unless you're playing against someone, I guess, who relies on blocking too much. Issue is, the AI doesn't really block enough for it to be a viable winning strategy either, so most of the time it ends up being a mechanic that you could almost forget about. Maybe it was seen more online? I don't know. Something more subjective that was changed in this game, at least to me, is that Soul Calibur 4 feels weirdly slow, I guess? Like everyone's movement and attacks were reduced in speed by like 30%. It's hard to explain, but there's just a sluggish feel behind everything. This might be my imagination, or it might be an actual design decision. All I know is that out of all of the main entries, 4 probably feels the worst at its baseline to me. It's not bad, don't get me wrong, it just doesn't feel as good as the other games. Another big new feature that's I think carried forward in every future game is the addition of destructible armor. Any character's armor can be destroyed by powerful charged attacks, and the character takes increased damage to the areas where they've lost armor. As you use each character, character in this game, you'll occasionally see their style level increase too. The style level affects what abilities that you can give to custom characters using that character's moveset. Speaking of characters, the character roster in this game is a bit smaller than 3's, but still includes some solid picks. The only brand new non-guest additions to this game are Algol and Hilda, which doesn't seem like a lot, but this game also seems to be rebuilt from the ground up in a new engine for the first time, so I can't fault it too much. There are some locked characters at the beginning, but most of them can be unlocked through in-game currency. There's 
also some bonus characters like we saw in Soul Calibur 3, but like Soul Calibur 3, these characters use other characters' movesets. The guest characters this time around are Star Wars characters, which is probably the weirdest, most unexpected choice for a Soul Calibur game. The Xbox version got Yoda, while the PS3 version got Darth Vader. Both versions got Starkiller from The Force Unleashed, and the platform-specific characters were eventually released as DLC purchases. Interestingly, the Star Wars characters have a unique gameplay element in that their Force abilities use up a Force Gauge, which recharges over time. If you try to use a Force ability with an empty Force Gauge, it just won't work. Moving on, the modes are single-player modes, versus modes, online modes, character creation, and museum. There's a not a lot of modes, actually, at least not compared to 3, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. Arcade mode is here and intact, and it works, you know, like an arcade mode. I did want to note, though, that the arcade mode's new post-match score breakdown feels almost like the Super Smash Bros. classic mode breakdown, if you know what I'm talking about. Story mode includes linear stories for every character, with each character receiving the normal text intros, but also fully animated cutscenes at the end, including the guest characters. This is one of those things that I kind of take for granted sometimes, so I'm super glad to see that here. Character creation returns from Soul Calibur 3 and has been expanded in some ways, but simplified in others. You can create a character from scratch using the base roster characters as a foundation, or you can edit the gear of the base characters themselves. Editing the base roster is actually the thing that's been expanded quite a bit here, and you have almost complete customization of their outfits and accessories, aside from the guest characters. Original characters, while fully customizable, are a bit more limited in that there's no distinct custom movesets anymore. You're pretty much stuck with clone characters of the base roster, and that's it. No tambourine-wielding dancers in Soul Calibur 4, unfortunately. That being said, there are way more customization options, and it does get a bit more in-depth, too. When you first make the character, you choose their equipment trait, which is basically just what kind of armor they wear. Then you choose their battle trait, which is kind of a stat skill focus, and then their alignment, which is good or evil. The game then can auto-generate a character based on these choices that you can freely customize. Additionally, instead of Soul Calibur 3's dedicated shop mode, you can buy gear directly in the character creation menus, making it way easier to see what you're buying in real time. When you're finishing up the creation, the last thing you do is set skills. Your available skills depend on the style level of the character that you're using the style of, but you can only set skills that don't exceed the skill point limit of your equipment. Skill point limit, you might ask? This is where I get into the mind-boggling decision that this game made that ruins the character creation for me. This game's customization is unique in that stats are tied to gear. And not just positive stats, no, but a mixture of positive and negative stats. Want to make a cool-looking character? Better hope that the coolness can also make up for the god-awful stats. If you want a strong character, you've also got to have a gaudy character, I guess. Oh, and the skills? These also affect the stats for some reason. Granted, they usually increase stats, but the fact that that's even a thing is wild to me. It is literally the embodiment of that one pro ZD video picking RPG clothes based on maxing stats instead of whether they match or not. Which is actually kind of funny because pro ZD or Sung Won Cho voices Huang in Soul Calibur 6. Anyways, I hate the stat thing. I just, I hate it. Oh, and you can't edit the guest character's appearances at all either. You can give them invisible rings with stat boosts though. Outside of the story mode, the other big single player mode in this game is Tower of Lost Souls. This mode is a linear series of battles broken down into floors, which are just missions. Some floors do have special modifiers and conditions, but it's dumbed down quite a bit from previous incarnations. Every floor on Tower of Lost Souls has a hidden unlockable character customization item. The requirements for unlocking the item are different on every floor, and to my knowledge, there's no way to know what the requirements are beforehand. Some of them are things like switch characters a certain number of times, guard a certain number of attacks in a row, or even stuff like destroying all the walls in the stage. While you can tackle these floors with standard characters at first, as you climb the levels, you eventually have to resort to using customized characters with extra gear and higher stats to succeed. I like this mode well enough, but it definitely feels like a downgrade from the Weapon Master admission modes we saw in previous games. It seems like they wanted to streamline the dynamic challenges by tying everything to character abilities and buffs, but I honestly preferred the wacky stage mechanics like quicksand and heavy winds more than this. Plus, this seems to be the entire reason stats are tied to gear, something that greatly hinders the customization and, in my opinion, the quality of this game. Versus modes include standard versus and special versus. Special versus is the same as standard, but equipment and weapon effects from the character creation are active here. Museum mode includes chain of souls, art gallery, event theater, and battle records. While most of these are pretty self-explanatory, chain of souls is a big character flowchart thing where you can look at every character's biography along with how they all connect to each other. This is dumb and totally unnecessary and I love it. I am not super well versed in the lore of Soul Calibur, but this almost makes me want to be. So Soul Calibur 4 is definitely one of the Soul Calibur games of all time. I look back fondly on this game for 
from when I first play it, but nowadays the main things I remember from it are the Star Wars characters and the dumb customization item stats. I don't know what that says about the game in general, but I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing. The addition of online modes was probably novel at the game's release, but nowadays the whole game just feels kind of anemic with a huge fatal flaw. I do love the overall presentation and UI and visual style. The cool glass crystal look is really unique, but the game itself is just okay. Not bad, not amazing. If you like Soul Calibur, you'll like this game. Soul Calibur Broken Destiny was released for the PlayStation Portable in 2009 and is in some ways almost a direct port of Soul Calibur 4. The intro is actually a big upgrade from Soul Calibur 4. It opens on Algol again, but immediately gets right into the action, featuring tons of action and a showcase of the guest characters. I mean, it's not much different from the Soul Calibur 4 intro at the end of the day, but that full minute of downtime and 4's introduction really does make a difference. The gameplay in this game looks and feels, at least to me, exactly like Soul Calibur 4 with the critical finishes and everything, though character switching does seem to be gone. I'm sure there's some kind of other differences under the hood, but as usual, I personally don't notice them if they're there. This game's roster is nearly identical to Soul Calibur 4's with the exception of the guest characters. Instead of Star Wars, this game has Kratos from the God of War series. There's also a brand new character with the introduction of Dom Pierre, the closest I think this series gets to an outright joke character, but he really is a lot of fun. The game's modes are Quick Match, The Gauntlet, Trials, Versus, Creation, Training, and Records. Quick Match is a mode where you can select a battle from a list of opponents. Each opponent has a preset username with a win and loss record. You can fight these battles with any character and fill out your own battle record, earning titles to attach to your profile over time. I think this is supposed to sort of simulate online matches without actually being online, but I'm really not sure. We will see this mode come back though, so let's move on. The Gauntlet is this game's sort of story mode. I say sort of because while it does tell a story, it also explicitly tells you that this story isn't at all canon to the overall series. There's tons of dialogue through text for every mission though. The missions themselves are usually just these sort of mini challenges rather than full fights, almost like a WarioWare micro game. These typically require you to perform a certain action like landing specific attacks or movement feats. Honestly, this mode feels like it's mostly sort of just a reflex training for fighting games in general, but I do kind of wish there was an actual story. A brand new mode is Trials Mode. There are three types of trials. Trials of Attack, Trials of Defense, and Endless Trial. Each one is essentially an arcade mode with a twist on the scoring mechanism. Trial of Attack has your score increase with connected attacks and decrease with defended attacks and damage taken. Trial of Defense has you gain score when you defend and quickly follow up on opponent's attacks. And Endless Trial is essentially a survival mode based on the Trial of Attack. Character creation returns and is mostly intact, but this time the gear isn't tied to stats. Of course, there'd be no point in this case, but it's still nice. The fact that they were able to scale down the character creation to the PSP while also adding some extra stuff to it is super impressive to me though. Finally, there's a versus mode, which is a local wireless multiplayer. It works fine, but there isn't an option for straight up player versus CPU matches with the option to actually select the CPU. No idea how this isn't here, but it was kind of weird for that to be missing in a fighting game. Broken Destiny is a nice side game to the main series. It's actually incredibly impressive that they managed to cram the entire core gameplay experience from Soul Calibur onto the PSP, but I do really wish there was more single player content here. I know that the PSP was meant more for bite-sized experience, which this game's single player mode does offer, but I think a Weapon Master style mode could have easily worked here. Either way, if you liked Soul Calibur 4, you'd probably like Broken Destiny, and I'd love to see a God of War reboot version of Kratos make a return as a guest in a future title. Soul Calibur Mobile is a mobile phone spinoff released in 2012. Now, when I say mobile phone, I'm talking about the kind of mobile phone that didn't do much more than just make calls, not modern smartphones. Right off the bat, there's no sound effects in this game whatsoever, but there is music playing at all times, and it seems like all of the music is adapted straight from Soul Calibur 4. It's midi-fied, but otherwise actually sounds really nice. Visually, I actually really like the art style here too. It's a faithful 2D recreation of the style of Soul Calibur 4, complete with identical stages and character designs adapted to this form factor. For an old school mobile game, it looks really nice. The gameplay is very bare bones, but kinda sorta manages to adapt the essentials from its console bigger siblings. There's two kinds of attacks, a kick, guarding, and even grabs. While there's no eight-way freedom of movement, there are three planes that you can move into and out of to avoid enemy attacks. You begin the game with only Mitsurugi unlocked, but with a shockingly large unlockable roster. Additionally, each character has more than one weapon 
weapon, and extra weapons can be unlocked with accrued money that you earn from playing most of the modes. Story mode seems to be how you unlock characters, which is done one at a time starting with Mitsurugi. The story mode opens with a text introduction, followed by a series of battles. During the final battle, there's some extra supplementary dialogue before the fight. Then, you get a text ending and move on to the next character. After the story mode, there's Arcade, Survival, and Tower of Lost Souls. Tower of Lost Souls is brought over from Soul Calibur 4, but in name only. It's essentially turned into a completely different mode. It's a bunch of predefined battles against opponents that you know ahead of time. I don't actually see how this mode is functionally different from just a standard player versus CPU battle mode, actually. Maybe way later down the line it gets more complicated, but I'm not really counting on it. Listen, I don't think anyone's expecting a masterpiece out of this game. It's not amazing, but it's also weirdly not bad. It's never gonna scratch that Soul Calibur itch, but it is a pretty impressive example of what can be done on super constrained specs. While I wouldn't necessarily recommend playing this, there are definitely a lot worse games you can play. Hi, Editor Sai here. I want to say that making this video is a lot easier than the last time in some ways, and a little bit harder in other ways. Like, listen, I own physical copies of these games, but what if there is no physical copy? What if one of the games is, I don't know, an old Java game that doesn't actually exist in any official capacity and has to be gotten from random websites that have really sketchy looking links and a lot of stuff that really is intended to trip you up? I spent a lot of time browsing these kinds of websites to get some of the things that I needed to record footage for this video, and I felt a lot better doing that thanks to the protection that I got from this video's sponsor, NordVPN. I imagine that if you're somebody who watches my videos, you're very, very smart and understand how VPNs work, but just in case, I will explain it just a little bit. A VPN is a sort of barrier that kind of masks your data from your ISP and from the websites that you're visiting. Whenever you visit a website and there's a bad actor involved, that website or that actor may try to steal your data. It's not even just bad websites, sometimes it's a straight up unsecured public Wi-Fi network. Fortunately, VPN services like NordVPN add a huge layer of security and a first defense barrier against that kind of data theft. And these can help protect you from things like malware hidden in websites or in sketchy emails too. The amount of personal data that these bad actors can get from you is actually wild. Encrypting it with NordVPN is an incredibly excellent and super easy way to keep your data on lock. NordVPN can also give you other unique benefits too. Like, I don't know, you ever found a really good movie or TV show on your favorite streaming service only to realize that it's actually not available in your country? Well, with Nord VPN, one click can get you access to that content and more. Get what you're paying for from your streaming services, for real. NordVPN can help you do that. And I think I know my audience pretty well at this point, and I've seen some of the, like, obscure websites that you guys go to to watch shows. Let me tell you, they are riddled with the kind of, like, bad malicious stuff that I'm talking about that NordVPN can help protect you from. NordVPN is truly one of the greatest lines of defense against that kind of thing, and I don't think I'd feel safe browsing the internet with any of my devices devices without it. At the end of the day, I think everyone should be using a VPN, and the best option? NordVPN. Right now, you can get a NordVPN two-year plan with an additional free four months by going to my link, nordvpn.com slash neosci. It's totally risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee, and I truly believe that once you start using NordVPN, you'll be wondering why you weren't using it to begin with. I want to give a huge shout-out to NordVPN for sponsoring this video and for making me feel safe browsing the web. Soul Calibur 5 was released for the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 in 2012. The intro to Soul Calibur 5 is one of those that goes for something different and, in my opinion, nails it. We're completely done with the big character showcase. This time, we're getting a big anime fight between Siegfried and Nightmare. Maybe it's because I'm a giant weeb. Maybe it's because I've been playing these games one after another. But I love this opening. It's not my favorite, but I genuinely appreciate how fresh it feels. Critical edges return, but this time they're different in execution. These unleash a super powerful cinematic attack at the cost of a full soul gauge. As far as the game's roster goes, there were a lot of changes, with some classic characters getting entirely booted in favor of new characters with similar movesets. To start, classic characters like Taki, Sophitia, Cassandra, and Talum are totally gone, along with a handful of others. Kalik returns, but as an edge master character who uses the movesets of male characters. The new characters like Natsu, Patroclus, Pyrrha, Leisha, and Shiva are here as replacements for many of the lost characters. Patroclus, Pyrrha, and Pyrrha Omega have movesets that that 
are super similar to the movesets of Sofitia and Cassandra, while Alpha Patroclus has a moveset similar to Setska's. Sheba has a moveset similar to Killick's old moveset, Leisha has Shangguas, and Natsu has Takis. Here's the problem, though. I know that they were trying to kind of do a Street Fighter 3 new generation thing with this cast, but they went about it in kind of the wrong way, I think. Instead of giving us characters with new and interesting movesets, they gave us new characters with the movesets of the characters that we were already attached to. All this does, at least for me, is make me want to use the original characters rather than these new ones. Don't get me wrong, I actually like some of these characters, especially Sheba, but I think it would have been cooler to have these characters use some new gameplay styles specific to them. In addition to these characters, there are a few new characters with distinct movesets like Zwei, Viola, and the guest character Ezio from the Assassin's Creed series. There was also a single downloadable character in Dampierre, making his return from Broken Destiny. The game's modes are offline play, online play, story, and creation. Offline play modes are Legendary Souls, Arcade, Quick Battle, Versus Battle, and Training. Arcade mode allows you to select a route, which includes options for choosing characters from a specific locale this time. Sadly, there are no character endings or introductions this time around, making this mode feel almost a little bit hollow. Quick Battle mode makes a return from Broken Destiny and works pretty similarly, just with an expanded feature set and more enemy variety. You can change the search criteria to find opponents in specific geographic areas, sort the opponents by strength, and by whether or not you fought them before. One of my favorite matches here, though, is a match against the one and only Harada himself, using the style of Devil Jeez. from the Tekken games. It's a brutally hard battle, but the fact that it's here at all is hilarious and awesome. Legendary Souls mode is an unlockable mode that you earn through completing the story mode. It seems to be a sort of arcade mode with the difficulty cranked up a bit. Well, more than a bit, actually. This mode is brutally hard, and I couldn't even win the first match after, like, a million tries. While this is definitely a skill issue, it's a skill issue in the same way that asking a turkey to climb Mount Everest is a skill issue. It's not impossible, but it's definitely super hard. I looked online and saw that a whole ton of people have talked about how difficult this mode is, so as far as I can tell, it legitimately is super difficult. Story mode is the primary single player mode in Soul Calibur V, for better or for worse. This mode is broken up into 20 total chapters, each one including anywhere from one to three fights bookended by cutscenes. A few of the important cutscenes are fully rendered in engine 3D scenes, which is a pleasant and welcome surprise for this game. For the most part, though, they're voiced dialogue scenes with accompanying artwork. I do really like the artwork aesthetic, though. I know that some of the development behind the scenes of this game probably led to the 2D artwork being this way, and it makes me wonder how much of these scenes were meant to be full 3D scenes. Maybe none of them. Maybe all of them. Who knows? Sometimes a 2D scene will transition into a 3D scene, too. Either way, I think personally that these 2D scenes are a perfectly acceptable way to present the story, especially with clever dynamic movement making this artwork feel way less static. I like the characters' lines in battle having consistency and context with the events of the story too, but what I like even more is the announcer himself giving contextual dialogue before the fights. The story is about Patroclus and Pyrrha, the children of Sophitia. While I won't get into specifics, the mode introduces the new cast gradually with a couple of appearances from legacy characters like Ivy, Siegfried, and Maxi too. For the majority of the mode, you play as Patroclus with a handful of fights featuring Zwa and Pira. Honestly, the biggest issue I have with this story mode, though, is that while I understand why they decided to focus on just a couple of characters, it kinda sucks the fun out of playing when you're not a huge fan of those characters' movesets. I just never really meshed with Patroclus or Pira's movesets, and being forced to push through as them alone made it way less enjoyable to complete this mode. This actually leads me into my secondary issue, though for me it's a more of a mixed blessing. The story mode is very short. It's about 20 chapters, and in a casual playthrough you could probably probably finish it in a single sitting. There's nothing necessarily wrong with the length, but some people may have wanted more out of a fully-fledged story mode like this, especially as it seems to be the only fully fleshed out narrative in the game in the absence of arcade mode endings. Character creation returns and works very similarly to how it worked in Soul Calibur 4, at least as far as its presentation goes, but fortunately they've added a ton of additions and improvements here, with the biggest one being that gear is NOT tied to stat changes this time around. As always, you can create a character from scratch or edit an existing character. Like the last Last game, custom characters are all based off of the existing roster, though there is one additional unlockable character style in the form of Devil Jeez from Tekken, making him technically a guest character, kinda. There's some new options for your character's body, including height and body size, both of which affect base stats like power and reach. While I'm sure this affects the balancing of custom characters quite a bit, I'm not technically proficient enough to know the differences. Another new addition is specialized equipment. These are additional items that can be added anywhere in your character's body, leading to a ton of possible creative uses. You can change their sizes, positions, rotation, and more. This can be used super creatively, or, you know, terribly. While you could always 
always change the color of your equipment, you can now also add patterns to equipment. This increases the possibilities for customization to ridiculous heights since most patterns have individually customized colors themselves. There are also new stickers that you can stick anywhere on your character, and while these are kind of gaudy at best when I use them, I'm sure there's tons of people that have made them look really cool in their own custom characters. So I personally really like Soul Calibur 5. I don't think it's a bad game at all, and the gameplay stands up against the gameplay from any other mainline entry in my opinion. Critical edges are a huge improvement from the critical finishers from 4, and the quick play mode is a novel inclusion. For the wider fighting game community, it seems like Soul Calibur 5 is considered one of the weakest entry in the series, and I can't really blame them. It feels good to play, truly, it's just that you can have the best gameplay ever. But replacing popular characters with completely new ones without being able to justify it outside of maybe a couple of story scenes, along with the absence of much robust offline content, people aren't gonna stick around for very long when they could play other, more feature-rich titles. Still, Soul Calibur V is excellent and you definitely shouldn't write it off. Soul Calibur Lost Swords was a free-to-play spin-off game released for the PlayStation 3 in 2014, but was shut down and rendered entirely unplayable in 2015. This game was basically the engine of Soul Calibur V repurposed into a mission-based single-player experience. The game brought back a lot of the missing characters from Soul Calibur V, like Taki and Sophitia, but the atrocious monetization meant that it was mostly an empty gesture. You see, when you began this game, you chose one of the base roster characters, but with nothing but their underwear equipped. I kid you not, this was how the game's progression was initially handled. You started with underwear and had to unlock clothes and equipment to equip to the characters. I believe you also could purchase the clothes for real money too. This isn't a huge deal by itself though because the worst part of this game was the energy system. I can't remember exactly how it worked, but the game limited the amount of time that you could play it by using an energy system. Sort of like how a lot of modern gacha mobile games work. You had the option to wait for the energy to refill or pay to refill it instantly. This was not ideal, especially for a game that I believe had a pretty significant grinding element to it. I really can't get too deep into this game's mechanics though because I'm going almost entirely on memory, but it just wasn't that great. I actually did play this game back when it was available, but I didn't play a whole ton of it for a bunch of reasons that I think are probably apparent. I attempted to see what would happen if you try to launch it today, and uh, yeah, you just can't. Anyways, I think the idea of a successful free-to-play fighting game has been proven to be possible since this game was released, but I think that the way that this this game approach monetization was absolutely not going to work out in the long term. While I'd say I'd be open to seeing another attempt at this kind of thing, I would never want to curse the fighting game community with something like that instead of a fully fledged numbered sequel, which this series absolutely deserves. Soul Calibur Unbreakable Soul was a mobile spin off released exclusively for iOS devices in 2014. Unfortunately, this is another one that's shut down since and is totally impossible to play. This game was a card based fighting game that looks like it kind of faithfully adapts the normal game gameplay just without direct control? I'm not entirely sure, but I'm pretty bummed out that this is yet another one of those games that's gonna be totally lost to history. Soul Calibur 6 was released in 2018. 6 has an intro sequence only the first time that you boot it up, which not only gives a full narration to explain the backstory of the entire series, but also establishes that this game takes place in a totally rebooted timeline, setting it around the same time period as the original Soul Calibur. This intro is definitely different from previous games, but I think it's done super well. I like this dynamic, almost motion-twinged animation art style, and I could listen to Xemnas give me a fantasy game's lore for hours. It also smoothly transitions into an in-engine 3D cutscene too, and a cool one at that. The intro also doubles as the introduction to the game's story mode, which I'll get to a little bit later. So I haven't really talked about the visuals in any of the games thus far, but I did want to point out that Soul Calibur 6 is beautiful in every way to me. The menus, the UI, and the just style in general are clean, and the in game visuals, especially the flashy effects, are just like massive dopamine hit after dopamine hit to me. This is one of the best looking fighting games in my opinion, and I am desperately hoping that we see another sequel with the fidelity of Tekken 8. Gameplay wise, this game mostly builds on mechanics we've seen from previous Soul Calibur games, but with the addition of a few new features. Critical edges return and function largely the same as they did in Soul Calibur 5, but this time your soul gauge is given a free full segment if you're losing at the beginning of the final round. One of the biggest new features is the reversal edge. These 
These are cinematic clash sequences that can be initiated with a button combo. Each player selects a button to activate an attack, and the winner of the clash is chosen in what is basically a game of rock, paper, scissors. You can also use a full gauge to activate what's called a soul attack. These are supercharged attacks that put you right into a soul charge when they're done. Maybe it's just my imagination, but the arenas in this game feel way larger than any previous game, and maybe that could have something to do with how much faster the battles seem to move too. Or I could be totally wrong. The roster here is incredibly solid too, with the core cast returning in full form and many missing characters returning in DLC. The character designs are very similar to the designs from Soul Calibur 1, but with some adjustments and additions. I assume this is because of the whole timeline reboot thing. This game was the first game in the series to not only have a large number of DLC characters, but also sell season passes that include the extra characters, their stages, and extra items for custom characters. You can purchase characters individually, but I elected to go for the season passes. The DLC characters here were a mixture of returning characters and, for the first time, guest characters. The first batch of DLC, which had a staggered release at the time, included 2B from the Nier series, Cassandra, Amy, and Tira. The second batch added in Hilda, Huang, Setsuka, and Haomaru from the Samurai Showdown series. God, I probably mispronounced that. Apart from the guest characters, the returning characters all have special gauges and gameplay twists like Huang's talismans. This is super welcome and to me it almost feels like what they should have done for the cast in Soul Calibur V to set them apart from their original counterparts a little more. One notable extra that they've added in the DLC that's my favorite touch is that for Haomaru stage, the announcer completely changes to the one from the most recent Samurai Showdown game. It's a little detail, but the little details are some of my favorite details. I really need to learn how to pronounce foreign words better. The modes in Soul Calibur VI are Libra of Soul, Soul Chronicle, Creation, Battle, Network, and Museum. Libra of Soul is a standalone mission-based story mode where you use an original created character to go through a branching story. The story is told in the first person from the perspective of your custom character, with occasional segments where you're able to select a conversation option. Sometimes the conversation options have a good or evil option, which affects the overall path your character takes at the end. The presentation is classic Soul Calibur, with each mission represented by a point on a map. Before and after missions, you usually get text-only cutscenes with tons of artwork and representations of various locales, but otherwise, the backgrounds are pretty static. On the map, you're able to choose your selected mission or side mission, go into the item or weapon shop to purchase items with your earned gold, or explore the surrounding area. Exploring the surrounding area lets you venture away from the main mission area on the map to pursue side quests, but the further out you venture, the more gold it costs. Once you select your destination, you begin to move toward it, but along the way you can hit random encounters with an enemy that could be a way higher level than you. Before you begin each mission or random encounter, you're able to change your playable character, their weapon, and also equip any food you've collected. You can also see the mission conditions, which vary and include things like disabling ring outs, increasing the damage of certain attacks, and even adding in slippery stages. This is a lot like the weapon master modes from previous games, and it's a very welcome thing to be reminded of. After each mission, you collect experience along with mission rewards like money, food, or even weapons. Story mode is a mode where you can play through a unique story to each character along with a linear main story where you play as multiple characters over the course of a number of years in the new timeline. This mode features cutscenes that are comparable to the scenes in Libra of Soul, but I think are done a lot better. It has a lot more unique artwork and tons of voiceover from every character. Both the standard story and the character-specific stories are linear, with cutscenes followed by battles, followed by cutscenes, rinse and repeat. That being said, I really enjoy these scenes thanks to beautiful artwork and solid voice work. Now, I will say that having a huge number of cutscenes might turn some people off to this mode, but I'm a big single-player story content kind of guy, so it's right up my alley. My one complaint is that the story mode, while it is a general all-encompassing story involving multiple characters, is mostly focused on Keelik at the end of the day. That's not really a problem, since playing musical chairs with tons of characters might limit the storytelling ability, but it is kind of weird that it's done in this way when everybody already has their own individual stories anyways. Speaking of the individual stories, these are less grand in scale, but still pretty entertaining. Most of the cast, aside from a couple of the guest characters, have full story modes with a unique artwork and voiceovers. And while the presentation is similar to the main story mode, the content is focused exclusively on the chosen character. My favorite story mode in this, though, is Cassandra's. In her story, the whole back half is about her encountering the original timeline version of herself. For the remaining modes in this game, the battle modes include the arcade mode, versus, and training. Arcade mode returns, and while it doesn't have any kind of special story elements to it, that's not really an issue when dedicated stories are available for almost everyone. What's neat is that there's a standby option that lets you play arcade mode while you wait for an online match, if that's the kind of thing you're into. Character creation mode returns and once again expands the options quite a bit. You now have access to different races entirely, including lizard men, mummies, automatons, colossi, and a bunch more. Otherwise, it feels super similar to what we saw in 5, but that's not a bad 
bad thing since 5's character creation already had absurd depth to it. Soul Calibur 6 really brought it with the single player content. There's tons to chew through here, and while it's still not quite as meaty as Soul Calibur 3, I'm perfectly happy with it. There's all kinds of content here, and I have zero complaints. Of course, there is online play in this game, and since it's the newest entry, I figured I'd give an online match a try. Well, I was going to, but I couldn't find a single ranked match. I tried on multiple days, and I just couldn't. I did play a couple of rounds against a friend of mine, and it felt pretty solid, but there's just nothing like playing against a stranger and finding out if you're gonna get completely bodied or if you'll pull through. You know what, though? This is a fighting game, and I haven't felt the punishment of losing online in the course of making this entire video. In fact, I've decided that I'm actually going to run a whole Soul Calibur 6 tournament, and if you own the game on PC or PlayStation, you're invited. This isn't just any normal tournament, though. This tournament has a twist. Every single match will be against me, Neo Sai. Every single competitor will battle me, and they will probably win. But simply beating me isn't the challenge. No. The victor of this tournament will be the competitor who is able to beat me the fastest. This tournament will be streamed live on my Twitch channel on Sunday, November 12th, 2023. There are a limited number of slots for entry, so if you are interested in joining the Soul Calibur 6 Neo Slayer 2023 tournament, join my official Discord where you'll be able to find more details. I'll have a link to the Discord in the video's description. For now, back to the normal stuff. I really like Soul Calibur 6. In my opinion, it's the most outright fun game in the series to just pick up and play, and it's also the most beautiful looking game in the series too. Is it mechanically the best? I have no idea, and honestly, I'm probably happier that way. See, I could dig in and try to learn all the optimal combos, iframe windows, and matchup counters in this game, or I could just keep enjoying it the way I always have been. And what's awesome is that these games appeal to both casuals like me and hardcore players who do care about that stuff. I know that this isn't specific to 6, but it rings especially true during a time where it's the newest and most commonly played option. Soul Calibur 6 is the final game in the series as of my original video back in 2021, and unfortunately as of this video too. The future of the series seems kind of in the air at this point, but hey, who knows? Tekken, Bandai Namco's other big fighting game series, is thriving with no signs of the hype slowing down, and I hope that in the future we see the same thing happen with a new Soul Calibur entry. I don't know who's in charge of the decision, maybe Harada, which, I mean, Harada, if you're watching, I mean, you're amazing. But if someone at Bandai Namco is watching this, please don't let this series die. It's an incredible series with excellent gameplay and a massive fan base, myself included. I may not be good at Soul Calibur, but I sure as hell enjoy playing it. I always have. And that's it for every Soul Calibur game. We made it. This was kind of an emotional video for me to make because my very first retrospective video was covering this series. Since then, so much has changed and I feel like I'm way better at this whole making videos thing and seeing how far I've come really makes me want to keep pushing myself to make more and more cool things for you all. The cherry on top is seeing how passionate the viewers like you are about the video games we all grew up with and I hope that I can keep making videos for you all full time for as long as I possibly can. Oh, and I made a promise back in 2021 to release a video of Mitsurugi vs. Taki in every main game, and I actually made that video this time. I'll put a link to that in the description, but you should be able to find it on my channel after this video is out too. I'm currently working on some really cool stuff, and I can't wait for you all to see it. I really want to thank my patrons for helping enable this kind of thing, including That's Ash and Cup Cup Meg Meg in the Played Every Game tier, along with all the absolute legends you see on your screen here. Thank you so much for the support, and thank you, viewer, for watching this video. I'll see you in the next one, and until then, have a fantastic day.